partnership with the four state DOTs of North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming, and the Mountain Plains Consortium, which includes eight universities in Colorado, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming. Thank you again for your time and attention. Today's presentation is some research finding on seismic repair retrofit of cast in place or precast columns of reinforced concrete bridge piers. And our presenter is Dr. Chris Panelides. Dr. Panelides is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Utah University of Utah. His research interests include seismic design of structures, evaluation and rehabilitation of reinforced concrete bridge construction. He's also interested in supplemental damping of structure for structural systems, earthquake engineering, and fiber reinforced compost composite materials. With that, Dr. Panelides, I'll go ahead and turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate this opportunity through the Transportation Learning Network. Uh, I'm here today to present to you the findings of some research, uh, actually two research projects sponsored by the Mountain Plains Consortium. First, I want to start by saying uh, thank you to my graduate students, former graduate students, Joel Parks, who works at KPFF, Boise, Idaho, Dylan Brown, Kramer and Brown, University of Colorado, Drew and at Wilson and Company, South Jordan. As an introduction, after strong earthquakes such as the 1994 Northridge, many bridges collapsed were severely damaged. By design, concentrated damage is supposed to happen at the ends of columns based on current design methodology, something we call the plastic hinge. So, of course, seismic repair of damaged columns is preferable to replacement. The question arises, how much damage can you repair? Now, in addition, rapid construction, minimal interruption, and economy are very desirable features in any repair method. Actually, there is very little research regarding repair of very severely damaged reinforced bridge columns of existing bridges. And as you will see today, when I say very severely, I also imply fractured bars in the column. Most existing bridges, of course, in high seismic regions are still cast in place. And during large earthquakes, uh, the longitudinal reinforcement can buckle or fracture, and the concrete will crash and spall. Repair of such damage involves removal of the concrete, typically, and replacement of the buckle and fracture steel reinforcement, which, of course, requires significant time and effort. So in this research, we try to develop an alternate process, perhaps one that's very rapid, so we can uh, recover very quickly after a severe earthquake. So in phase one of these projects, uh, since the project was following one where we studied the joints of accelerated bridge construction bridges, we repaired four columns of bridges constructing with the ABC method. In phase two, we also repaired two casting place columns and two columns again with accelerated bridge construction, but these were very severely uh, damaged. In fact, one of them was the second repair and then one of them, we completely separated the column from the beam. So in one respect, the second repair could also be thought of as a new method for ABC accelerated construction. So let's start with phase one uh, of the experimental program, repair of accelerated bridge construction. The use of precast pre bridge elements is popular for accelerated bridge construction, but mainly in areas where there is no earthquake, states like Texas, and other states where they don't have strong earthquakes. So in areas where there is earthquakes, there is currently a big push to generate uh, construction practices with accelerated bridge construction methods and to resist earthquakes. So here you're seeing some pictures from the front runner uh, bridge in, in uh, which is the front runner train here in, in Salt Lake City. So uh, as you can see, this is a very fast method, very rapid construction method. But what happens if we have an earthquake? And we actually recently had an earthquake in Salt Lake City, magnitude 5.7 last month, uh, or a couple months ago, March. So how are we going to be able to repair a damaged bridge? Uh, and uh, of course, that is a very good option if the damage is something that can be repaired, uh, as opposed to replacing the so uh, some of the work that we've been doing and what you're seeing in this picture is uh, an element with grab and splice slip connections. And these particular bridges are good candidates for repair 
due to the localized damage. So we actually did a couple of tests of the original bridge columns uh, with splice lift systems, uh, two splice lift sy systems. First one is the lantern interlock, which you're seeing here, where one bar, the factory dowel, is threaded actually into the connector, and the other bar, the field dowel, it's actually uh, crowded, as you can see from the two poles here. So we use this element to connect the uh, cap beams and columns. The other system we tried was the NMB splice lift, where both the factory and the field tiles are crowded in a cast iron sleeve, as you can see here. And these dimensions are for number eight parts, which is what we use in our research. So here you can see uh, four of the, the four specimens that we, we studied and we had tested previously. Uh, and uh, as you can see, we have the splice sleeve in the footing. And this one is the sleeve in the footing. Here we have another specimen with the splice sleeve in the column. And also, as far as the beams, we have the lantern interlock a sleeve into the cap beam, which is upside down. We can also have it in the column. And the column is a half scale of an actual bridge here in Salt Lake City, actually in, in Ogden, Utah. It's called the Riverdale Bridge, it's a half scale. So you see an octagonal 21-inch uh, column uh, with six number eight bars and the number four spire of two and a half inch. So you can see the specimen here. Uh, the pier cap, of course, is upside down. And you can see the lenton interlock splice leaf in the cap beam. And, and I mentioned already the dimensions of the column, 21 inches. The original column is 40. So, of course, what we do is uh, we secure the beam or footing upside down in this case, and we apply a lateral load at the mid height of the column to simulate earthquake damage. So, in this particular uh, set of the first four tests, these are the properties of steel break 60, uh, concrete. Uh, depending on the day, we tested anywhere from 5 to 9 KSI steel. Uh, and this is for the uh, NM, the uh, NMB splice leaf. And for the lantern, we had, uh, again, grade 60, except for the field, uh, for, for the factory steel threaded bar, we, we, uh, we used 75 KSI. At concrete, again, from 6 to 9 KSI. So here, again, you can see the setup. Uh, roughly the elevation from the top of the footing to the center of the actuator is 8 feet, it's 96 inches. So when I talk to you about drift ratio, you will know I'm dividing some displacement here, cyclic displacement by 96. So roughly the displacement, if it's 1 inch, is 1 over 96, is also 1% approximately. So you can see the, the uh, direction of the force is in the east-west direction. And you can clearly see in the cross section in that direction, we only have two bars. So if you lose any of these two bars, you've lost your strength. Uh, the longitudinal bar, six number eight, in a 21 inch uh, octagonal cross section is 1.3% steel ratio, which easily satisfies the one to 4%. And the volumetric spiral, the number four at two and a half inches, is a 2%, which easily is more than 0.5%. So again, uh, I want to point your attention that we have these two bars that are very critical in the extreme east-west uh, direction. So you can see here a nice image of how we're applying the lateral load, simulating the earthquake. And also, we use threaded bars in a reaction frame with a hydraulic jack to generate the axial loading. So the, in the test procedure, two cycles per drift level were applied. We start from very small drift ratio, 0 0.25, 0 0.5 actually percent, which means roughly half an inch. And up to 3%, we go a drift ratio. We go two cycles per drift ratio, and the rate is 1.2 inches. After that, we increase the, after 3% drift ratio, we increase the loading rate to 4 inches. And the axial load I mentioned earlier was set to 6% of the column axial compression capacity. So in the original test, these are the four that 
were tested for the ABC connection. We got, had relatively good performance. We reached drift ratios up to 8% approximately, which correspond to ductility of about 7. Uh, one of the specimens was actually not tested properly. The actual ran away from us, so we had a very low ductility. Uh, but in all four cases, I want to make sure that you understand we had severe damage uh, for the first three specimens, either the east or the west part fractured, and for the last specimen, we had a bar pull out from the lens on interlock uh, sleep. So here is the damage of the original specimens, and you can clearly see uh, this is the NMB. NM means NMB, and LE means lengthen. Uh, if you look at it at the front uh, or on the side, you can clearly see the fracture of the bar here, as well as in this case, as well as in this case, this is the one, LE2, where we have bar pull out from. So how do we fix this? Well, let me go back and, and ask the audience, do you think this is something that you guys would try to attempt and, and fix and repair? Anyone? <laughs> you can go ahead and make your comments in the Q&A again, which is located in the bottom right-hand corner of your webinar window. Uh, well, let, let's just say it's, it's a, a, a difficult task to do, and most people would probably replace the bridge at this stage. I would say no. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's a difficult task. Yes. But we decided actually to go ahead and do it. And it takes, it takes really a, a lot of bravery to say, yes, I'm going to repair it. Uh, but I had some experience. So uh, in about 1998, we had the opportunity to actually test the I-15 bridges because they were going to be replaced here in Salt Lake City uh, for the Olympics for the 2000. So we did some work on a re, uh, re retrofit of bridges with carbon fiber deposits. So we used that concept of using carbon fiber and forced polymer jacket, as you see here in this image, to get us thinking about how we do this. But of course, when we did this test, we didn't have any fracture bars. Another study that was done by Lehman et al. repair damaged column in the lab by casting a concrete jacket around the double headed longitudinal steel uh, headed bars, as you can see here in this image. And this started us thinking, if we can do that uh, a little bit faster than setting up a whole reinforced concrete jacket like this, maybe, maybe it would be a thing to do. In the meantime, um, with another student, uh, Dr. Yan, I had developed some methods of improving um, the confinement of rectangular columns by using uh, carbon fiber jackets and expansive grout. So we discovered if you take a column, a rectangular column, and you turn it into elliptical, then you investigate its confinement. It's actually pretty good. And if you use expansive grout, that actually helps you even better because you're post-tensioning the carbon fiber jacket. Finally, in my test on the I-15 corridor bridges, South Temple, one of the things we discovered was that there was a deficiency in the connection of the pile cuts to the piles. And the problem there is we had uh, four number six bars sticking into the, from the piles into the pile cups. Piles were 12 inch steel uh, tubes uh, with reinforced concrete inside. But the reinforcement into the pile cups was very minuscule. There wasn't enough development. So in that case, to make sure that this connection would work, prematurely, we actually drilled from the top of the pile cups into the piles, a distance of about eight feet, and uh, we actually Im embedded um, uh, Duirac bars. We didn't post-tension them, we just epoxied them in, uh, with an out on top and a steel plate. And this system worked very well. So this taught us that you could actually uh, engage the piles and the pile cups and you replace the tension capacity that's lacking at the same time. So with all this background, we started thinking, how can we repair this column? So one of the things we did, we actually used uh, headed bars into the footing, which stuck out of the column the appropriate development length, 
and we epoxy them into the into the footing, as you can see here. Then instead of using steel uh, hoops, we use carbon fiber layers, four carbon fiber layers in the hoop direction. These are very quick to fix uh, with an appropriate gap at the bottom between the carbon and the top of the footing so we don't crush the carbon when we apply the seismic load. And then we filled the gap, the void that was created uh, between the original column, the octagonal column, and the carbon fiber shell with the repair. So this was the simple uh, idea that we had. And since we had six number eight bars in the column, we decided to use six number eight uh, headed bars. Of course, we had only broken one or two bars in the original column. But we thought that we probably needed to put six, which uh, may have been an overkill, but we wanted to just replace one. So carbon fiber, for those of you who are not familiar, is a very high strength, tensile strength material. We use unidirectional, which means all the fibers are in single direction. It's lightweight, easy to use, non-corrosive. And we knew from our previous experience that it can improve ductility, enhance shear strength, and in our case, also provide a stay in place form for this shell and this concrete uh, surrounding the headed. The material we used had an ultimate tensile strength, 113 KSI, modus of elasticity 9,400 KSI, and an important number, the ultimate tensile strength, 1.2%. And this, of course, is less than steel, but it may be enough in a confining situation. All these properties were, were obtained using ASTM standard T33. One of the things, of course, you realize when you uh, apply the the uh, carbon fiber shell, which we affectionately call the donut because of its shape. Uh, you can see here it's 18 inches tall. Then, of course, you are reducing the, the lever arm, the moment arm for the moment capacity of the column. And because of that, of course, you need to provide a little bit higher capacity. Otherwise, you don't have enough capacity. So we took care of that, and we were aware of it. And that's one of the reasons we need six. Bars. So here you see the procedure, uh, and the procedure, of course, that we're doing is we're taking a damaged column, plastic inch, we're using headed bars, we're applying carbon fiber shell. Uh, we had to splice it in the first uh, generation of this repair technique. Uh, we use an intact, uh, actually we used the carbon fiber, we used the sonar tube, and then we spliced the carbon fiber around it, and then we filled it with repair concrete. So we also refer to this method as plastic hinge relocation, because you can see the plastic hinge down here. And by strengthening this donut around the bottom, where we know we're going to probably develop a plastic hinge right above the repair. So that's why this method is also known as plastic hinge relocation. So here I'm going to show you a video now of one of our tests. Uh, the speed of this video is 200 times faster than the real test. And you can see down here, I'm showing you the displacement, two inches, three inches, and so on. And you can see this is the original one. And this is just to show you how damaged the original test uh, specimen was. Here from the side, see it as well. Definitely developing cracking at the bottom area, you can see here, and some crushing. Uh, at four inches, the cracks are growing really big. Uh, we see a lot of spalling. Five inches, the spalling now has reached about half the size of the column. And now you're going to see, of course, the, uh, the donut. Uh, this is the repair. And definitely, you can see the moment arm now is reduced, but still, uh, are able to go into high dimensions. So uh, it really is possible to repair this column even with fracture bar. You can see the column is uh, actually resisting the load. Um, and I think here uh, my students wanted you to see, uh, or at least hear, what happens when the bar fractures. In fact, we were able to fracture the bar after 
parent second time. So here we go, three inches, four inches. You can see the spalling, the cracks are getting bigger. And developing a plastic hinge above the top. So this is now, I think, at real speed. Uh, you can hear the cracking of the carbon fibers, which means the donut is engaging uh, in a hoop uh, stress direction. And at about seven inches now, you can hear the bar fracturing. So, and then another bar fracture. So we actually fractured two bars. And uh, of course, uh, you're wondering how it was your performance. Well, uh, here we go. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see the force versus drift uh, ratio curve. The black line, the black dotted line is the original specimen. And the red line is, is the retrofitted specimen. And you can see on the left also the energy, the black and white are the original specimen. The pink and the red are the retrofitted specimen. And you can see that actually we're able to replicate pretty much the performance of the original specimen. The same thing happened with the, the, the ones with the method. So in summary, what we were able to do in both cases, including in the beam, started with a plastic hinge in the original column. Uh, we used a carbon fiber shell with the headed bars and concrete and we were able to relocate the plastic hinge above this bonnet. The same thing happened with the cap beam. We started with the plastic hinge. We were able to relocate above the bonnet the plastic hinge. So what that means is, in effect, we're getting a second life. We're giving a second life after the earthquake. Here you can see some comparisons, um, the repairs. This is the repair. We had ductilities up to six or 6.6, uh, and we had West Tennis bar, bar fracture in one case. Uh, in another case, Lenton 1, we had a bar fracture, but also we also had some cracking into the carbon fiber jacket. Here you can see a, a, a graph of the elevation above the footprint, all the way up to the top of the donut, it's 18 inches. And the horizontal axis is the strain, the hoop strain in this donut. And you can see, as we expect, when we get close to the top, the strains are increasing. And this line here actually shows you where the top of the headed bars are. And of course, the top of the headed bars, that's where we're developing all the tension that connects this uh, column to the footing. And you can see this is what we expect to see. We expect to see the strain to get much higher. The number here is less, of course, than the capacity of the the composite has a capacity of 1.2% tensile strain. You're saying we're about a third of that. Uh, in the other specimen, though, with the lentil, we saw quite a bit of uh, non-uniform or non-predicted uh, strain distribution. And this is because it seemed like the four layers that we had were getting into very high strains. So you can see um, in this first generation of the repair, we only had carbon fiber layers in this direction. This direction where you see the white uh, white marker, which shows you a crack, and you can see it clearly. So because the fibers were only in the hoop direction, we, we got some cracking in one of the specimens. Uh, and of course, we learned from this. Since these are unidirectional carbon fibers, in the second generation, we started putting carbon fibers in so in phase two, then, we use carbon fibers both in the hoop and the vertical direction of the shell. And uh, we implemented it to two columns that were cast in place, if you remember. These were had severe damage, including concrete crashing and longitudinal parse fracture and buckle, uh, because the cast in place uh, achieved very high ductility, the original specimen. So actually, we saw some buckling in the parse in addition to fracture. 
And uh, we also applied the vertical carbon fibers for two columns, which were precast specimens. One was repaired for the second time, and we also used epoxy crack injection. And one was completely separated from the copy. Just cut all the bars, and this almost looks like a new ATC structure. So here are the uh, dimensions. It's the same dimensions as you saw earlier. Uh, two feet thick, everything's two feet. The footing is, is three feet wide. And the only difference, actually, is the length of the footing of the capping, which is upside down. So the casting place was designed according to seismic uh, Ashto and Caltrans codes. And it was a very well-designed uh, connection. And we used it, of course, to compared to the original ABC. And then the ones where we uh, had ABC, both of them had uh, lantern uh, sleeves in the column. One of them was bonded with the capping, and the other one was just a regular bond. So you can see the damage in the, in the uh, original casting place specimens. You can see that in addition to our fracture, we have buckling. Uh, the packing actually goes over all the spirals. Uh, and so we also had fracture again in the specimen pudding. This is the specimen. Uh, as you can see, the plastic hinge is very well formed in the original specimens, about 12 to 16 inches above the interface. And again, this is severe damage, but I think Chris, again, would not there there. But we like to take it to the extreme, so we try to repair these ones and see how would this fare. And these are very well designed uh, to current seismic. Uh, the other two I mentioned, they are specimens that either cut completely the bars after being damaged in the original test, or it's the one where we had some cracking original repair. So we took out the donor and we built a new donor. So the original specimens had achieved a fantastic uh, ultimate drifts, 9.3 for the beam, 8.8 .8, uh, drift ratio for the footing, and ductilities between 9 and 10. These are very stellar performances. Uh, as far as the precast specimens, they, they had not achieved very good performance. That's why we decided to repair them. And they were available, so something between 5.6 uh, and 5.5, the original had achieved 6.7% drift. Uh, and these are, by the way, these are also large drift ratios uh, by any means, but of course not as good as the cast place. And here you can see the about a five. So what was different? This is the phase two experimental program. So here we, we elevated a little bit the plastic hinge relocation. We, we made our donut instead of 18 inches. Um, we use bone shrink concrete inside the, the shell. And uh, as I mentioned, the major difference uh, is we actually used seven layers instead of four layers in the hoop direction of carbon fiber, and we used two vertical layers. This is what the 7H2 being seven horizontal hoop layers and two vertical. Uh, as far as our uh, steel reinforcement, the headed bars, it's the same story. Uh, we used uh, 17 and a half inches in the repair concrete and 19 inches into the footing. Again, number eight headed steel bars. So before we did it for the second phase, we actually did a finite element analysis to determine exactly how many layers in the first phase, we used four layers, if you remember. And now we found out that if we use four layers uh, the second time, that would represent a stress of 63 and a half KSI, or actually 97% of the allowable carbon fiber reinforced polymer stress. Now, you probably remember I told you that the ultimate was 113 KSI, and you're probably thinking 97% doesn't look like 63.97. Well, there is a code, ACI 440. There's a committee, actually, that would write uh, provisions for seismic retrofit carbon fiber. And because, as you can see here, even though the load is east-west, 
And eventually, this carbon fiber is going to see trioxide stress. Once the column starts bending, you will see compression on one side and tension on the other. And you will see vertical also stress, not just stress. So for that reason, ACI 440 uh, allows an efficiency factor of only 58% of the original tensile strength of the carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is unidirectional. So its orthotropic properties make it vulnerable in the perpendicular to fiber direction. So in order to take account all the three-dimensional uh, stresses that this shell is seeing, the code only allows you to use 58% of the ultimate tensile capacity of the deposit. So that's why you see that even 63 and a half KSI is 97% of the ultimate capacity. So you see we run a pushover analysis here of this column uh, in the original, which is the dotted line, and in the uh, finite element retrofit. You can see the demand, of course, as we Increases in terms of force. And, uh, but if we use seven layers in the hoop direction and two vertical layers, we're able to reduce that demand to only 36.4% uh, stress, or 55% of the allowable carbon fiber in force point of stress. And this, of course, makes our shell much more robust. And it's, it's more money, of course, because it's more layers. But uh, again, uh, the issue here is speed and efficiency of the area. Now, for the last specimen, the one we completely separated, as you can see here, as I mentioned, this one here, all the bars are cut. Two were fractured actually during the test, but the other four we completely cut it. And in this case, of course, the, there is a concern. Are you going to be able to bond the original concrete to the uh, concrete that you're putting inside the shell, the non shrink concrete. If you cannot do that, you will have separation between the shell and the original column. In order to improve this uh, bond or reduce the chances that the column will separate from the non shrink concrete, we actually developed this uh, steel collar. And in the steel collar, which was welded actually uh, just by, by welding it around, you can see it's six inches tall, uh, and uh, it's only three eight inch thick steel. And just by welding it, it's able to uh, attach itself from the shrinkage of the steel. And then we we welded their studs. As you can see, these are standard uh, two and a half inch studs, uh, one inch diameter, uh, two and a half inches long. We put six studs, as you can see, actually eight studs, as you can see here. And uh, we are, we're hoping that with this task, we would be able to engage the non shrink concrete to participate along with the carbon fiber shell in resisting the lateral uh, load. So again, for most of the uh, specimens, the three of the four, we didn't use the collar. We only used the collar for the one that was completely severed. Um, so uh, the question, of course, I'm talking about rapid repair. How rapid is it? So I'm going to show you how quick this is. Again, this is a half-scale specimen uh, in terms of the lab. So we figured out about eight hours. Uh, we had professional companies drill the concrete and epoxy and steel bars. So that took six hours. Uh, in the previous phase, remember, we had spliced the carbon fiber, but here, we learn from that, and we splice the sonotube. And instead of splicing the fiber, we just splice the sonotube. It's just duct tape. Uh, and then we uh, laid the carbon fiber layers, both the uh, hoop layers and the vertical, you can see the different colors here. Uh, and that took about an hour onto this uh, sonotube. Once the carbon fiber had cured, we actually removed uh, and then we filled it in with the non string grout, and this took about an hour. Now, the one where we had already tested before with the donut, the third time we were going to test it, we had to epoxy inject the cracking to remove the, the non string concrete, and we epoxy injected all the cracks. But as you can see, there's still some cracks, and of 
for severe damage. And uh, the headed bars are still the same ones. Uh, this took about half an hour. Now, here is the one where we completely separated. You see, there is no bar sticking out of there from the beam. Uh, here are the six headed bars. And here is our steel jacket, steel collar with, with the studs. That took about an hour. Now I'm going to show you a video of the test uh, for this second phase. Here again, this is a uh, video is accelerated because our, our quasi-static cyclic tests are very slow. Uh, they take typically about four to five hours to complete. Uh, here you see on the upper right-hand side the uh, number of the displacement up on top, one inch at this point. Now we go to two inches. You can see some damage starting to happen. Cracking and spalling has started at around two inches. Now we're up to three inches. And now the cracks are starting to really show. Well, I see we have a lot of sunlight there. It's hard to see, but you will see it later from the side. And you can see how the column is still able to resist capacity. And the donor is helping it, of course, uh, to create a a rigid uh, section down at the bottom. Definitely, we're moving the damage of the original donut and the original plastic hinge. And you can see the cracks now at six inches. Again. Very large. Spalling is started now, uh, both above the donut. And in this case, in this particular case, we have some damage also inside. But we're at seven inches, which is amazing consider that these uh, columns had already gone up to nine inches lateral drift. This is the casting place. So it's an amazing performance. Now we are at eight inches, or roughly about 8%. Now we're at nine inches. So needless to say, uh, this performance is, is really very close to the original one. Uh, and uh, I want to show you what it looked like. Uh, there was a gap that was generated at about 2% ratio between the repair concrete and the original column. You can see definitely a lot of damage of the donut. Uh, in this case, we had also damaged 2.5 inches inside the donut. Uh, we had concrete crashing, of course, and two extreme parts fracture. So even in this case, we're able to fracture the bars right above the beam or capping. And then we're able to fracture them again uh, in the new plastic hinge, which means we're getting a fracture of bars within about two feet, which means our donut is really strong and can really develop a tensile capacity of the bars for the second. Uh, you can see here, these are the casting place specimens. This is the beam. And the beam, of course, was a little bit narrower than the donut. So you see a little bit of gap. That was easy to do. We just put some formwork and made sure that the uh, motion concrete would not escape. Uh, the footing, of course, was wide enough. And that was easier. But you can see that there is significant damage, crashing and development of plastic hinge above the donut. So we can claim that truly we have actually uh, relocated the plastic hinge. We gave this column a second life. Uh, and this damage extended sometimes up to 20 inches above. Um, the ones that were done with the accelerated construction technique, they also work. Uh, damage was about 10 to 20 inches above the donut. No damage within the donut. And both cases, two extreme bars fracture. So truly, what this means is the method can work very well both for casting plays and precast call. The performance, you can see the black line is the original 
trust in place specimen, and the red line is the repair. And of course, as we expected, we saw higher force capacity, higher strength, and roughly the same displacement drift ratio was a little bit less than the original casting space column. And a little bit less energy dissipation, this, this phenomenon is called pinching, the hysteresis curves, but still very good energy dissipation, both for the cadmium and the fluid. And again, you see a little bit extra strength, which arises, of course, because we have more bars and we also have a short arm. But I would say that this performance is certainly very acceptable. Uh, and it's very hard to imagine that we're getting this performance after the original specimens had buckle and fracture bars. So here you can see um, the original cap, uh, casting place cap beam had a drift ratio of 9.3, maximum load of 36 kips. And the repair one had a maximum load of 47 kips and a drift ratio of 8. Due to the fact that the bars had already yielded, uh, the yield displacement was slightly larger for the repair specimens, so our displacement ductility went from 9.9 to 6.8. 6.8 is nothing small. It's, it's, it's very good, actually, very good. As far as the footing, we went from a drift ratio of 8.8, .8, the original, to 8.4 in the repair. Maximum strength, 36.5 lateral load, kips, uh, repair 44.7. So again, we were able to retrieve the strength. And again, as I mentioned, because the bars were buckled and yielded, uh, the displacement, the yield displacement was fairly larger for these specimens, the repair ones. So the ductility you can see is a little bit less, six versus 8.9. But again, a ductility of six is very satisfactory. A drift ratio of eight is really very satisfactory. Uh, these are the uh, responses for the precast specimens, the ABC method. And you can see the red is the uh, second repair, the pink is the first repair, and the black is the original. And it seems like uh, we're doing better as we go along. We're putting three earthquakes instead of one earthquake. And actually, these, these loading uh, protocols are much more severe than uh, because of the quasi-static nature and the increasing drift ratios of the loading process that I showed. So you can see uh, the performance of these last one, the best one. Uh, this is the one where we completely separated the column from the beam, and you can see that this performance is better than the original, for sure. But it's still a satisfactory performance. In this case, we can say we have a very good repair method but we can also say we have a very good ABC method, even for follow. So comparing the numbers, uh, here you will see that this is the first one, uh, the beam. This is the original test. This is the first repair, 49.9. This is the second repair, 53 kips. Uh, the ultimate drift ratio in the original was 6.7. The first repair, 5.6. Now it's 7.8. And you can see that the first case we were not able to determine because it was pre-damage. But in the first repair, the ductility displacement ductility was 5.1. The second case was 5. .6. And the one where we completely severed the six column bars, original strength was 39.7. Now with the air is 49. Original drift ratio was 5.5. Now 7.6. Original ductility was 4. .5. This is the specimen that actually had failed by bar pullout of the lantern interlock sleeve. That's why you see that now we're getting actually better. better than so if we compare the four uh, repaired results, um, these are the casting place specimens in red, and in blue, these are the precast specimens. This is the one that was test tested a third time uh, with epoxy injection. And this is the one which was completely severed. Uh, we can see we're getting similar uh, lateral load capacity, uh, ultimate drift ratio from 7 to a little more than 8%. Uh, failure mode getting 
concrete crushing and R fracture uh, in all of this. And displacement, actually, we're getting between 6 and 7. So I, I would say 5.6 and 7. I would say that this repair is a very effective method, even for damage severely displacement, whether they are cast in place or they are, whether they are pre -cast. In other words, following the ABC. Now, how about the, the hoop uh, profile, the hoop strains? And see here the strains in one of these donuts, uh, the one with seven layers hoop and two vertical. And you can see we're getting the performance we expect. As we go up uh, in elevation up to 18 inches, where roughly the top uh, of the headed bars is, we can see the strains increasing, which is exactly what we expect. We're effectively, if you look at the top six inches of the shell, we're creating some kind of a, of a ring up here, uh, a ring six inches deep, if you will, and seven inches thick, or seven layers thick, I guess, in the hoop direction and two layers in the vertical direction. And what this tension ring helps to do, first of all, it helps confine the concrete all the way up. But here at the very top, uh, it helps refrain the top bars from starting to become like cantilevers, because these bars cannot go outside the ring. Our donut uh, confines these bars, so if they start trying to bend, uh, the, the ring actually comes around and grabs them, holds them in place in their vertical position to serve as the tensile connection member between the, the damage column and the original column, the original footing or cap. So, so this concept of a ring around the top of the donut in the carbon fiber jacket. It's a very powerful one. And it's actually the method that we use to develop uh, some kind of a simplified design method to design this donor. Uh, and as you can see, the strains here are reaching about 0.5%, which is where we wanted them to be. If you remember from our finite element analysis, we didn't want to go too far higher than this because now we're entering into the three-dimensional stresses of the carbon fiber and material, which is not, <laughs> it's very uh, unidirectional properties make it wrong. So we can say that these, these carbon fiber shell form a very effective tension ring. Uh, a similar thing happened with the pre uh, members. So uh, the question, of course, arises now, yeah, this is all fine and nice, and you did it in the lab, but what happens in the real world? How can we design for these donuts? How can we make these methods practical? And of course, in order to do this, uh, we need to really understand how this donut behaves in a very fundamental way. And in order to do that, uh, we need to develop some analytical tools to do that. Uh, and of course, the problem here is not a very simple one. Uh, we have uh, carbon fiber, we have the original damaged steel bars that were reinforcing the column. Uh, we have fracture bars, we have buckle bars. And your model also needs to be able to somehow capture the fact that if you're going to use this as a design tool later on, you cannot be doing finite element analysis or even I'm going to show you some advanced uh, dynamic analysis. Uh, most engineers would like something practical to use in the design of. So if they have a column in the real world that's damaged like this, how am I going to give me some tools on how I'm going to repair it quickly, how I'm going to design this carbon fiber jacket, and uh, let's just see. So in order to get to that final stage of design, uh, we try to perform an analytical study. And in this case, we develop simplified models. Well, we started with some very uh, detailed models, then we simplified the models, and we tried to compare the results. Once we, we saw good comparison to the results, we got a little bit uh, more comfortable and going back to our measurements with the hoop strains that I showed you earlier, we were able to develop a, a simplified procedure. So the bone slip is a very important uh, topic because here we're pushing the column all the way out to its limit, 
And uh, we can have, as you can see on the right, either splitting concrete failure or a pull-out failure. In other words, the power will slip. Uh, and, and this phenomenon has been, uh, I, I mean, identified a long time ago, in Pelican House in 1992, and Harajli later in 2000. So um, if the concrete is not well confined, uh, this bone failure will happen. And it will affect your global response by reducing your strength. So there are models out there. This is the European model, actually, this is the uh, local model, the federal model, uh, Federation of International Beton. And this shows you that the stress in the bar actually will start to go down the more you start splitting uh, the cone. Or you can have pull out. So, uh, in order to develop robust analytical models that we take into account bone slip, a failure, uh, yielding of the bars, buckling of the bars, and even fracture, uh, we, we develop models with my student, uh, Roy Yang Wu, which uh, use fiber elements. And these analytical models are, are, are pretty time consuming to, to develop, and we use a program called Open. This is an open source code developed at the University of California. Uh, in this case, as you can see, we can model the performance of this column with the donut using only three nodes. So only three nodes are used, but of course the, the elements are very involved. As you can see here, we're modeling everything. We're modeling the cover concrete, the damaged steel, uh, the steel that isn't damaged, and the confined concrete. So we have a section here at the top of the column where it was not much damage. And uh, the element that was used for the column is called the beam. And of course, we concentrate the damage right above the donut. We know that's the relocated plastic beams. And in this case, you can see we have a, a modified steel because here now we have the damage developing. And inside the donut itself, uh, we are actually developing not only the original column, as you can see, even though it's octagonal, we turn it into a circular, but that's acceptable. It's a good approximation. Uh, and we're also modeling the headed steel bars that you can see here in blue. So not only the original column, the confined concrete from the carbon fiber, uh, which is the non shrink route, and then the original concrete, then the original bars. So everything is being modeled here. And uh, this last node is at the top of the node. So the only thing we're not modeling here is the donut. So right. what happens, of course, is since we're dealing with damaged specimens, we cannot account for steel, for example, on its original form. So here, the dotted lines, you see what we consume is the stress-strain behavior of steel reinforcement in our original. These columns, these columns were tested, and there are still conditions. Uh, they're not going to be uh, as pristine as the original steel bar. So uh, Vasuki and Saidi uh, developed a model which actually reduces the stiffness of steel, as you can see here, uh, substantially uh, because of this effect. That these, these, these bars have already yielded. Uh, in addition to that, um, I will show you one method where we uh, in addition from the original, we go to the damaged steel, the stress strain curve of the steel. But now the bars are already uh, have buckled, and of course there is a chance that they will uh, they will slip. So we are modifying also for the bond slip effect. You can see how we are reducing the slip. Chris, we do have a question if you don't mind. Sure, I, I, I cannot see it actually. Can you tell me what it is? Yep, I will. So in these tests. It appears that the loading on the joint is mostly bending, so you have tension in some of the bars. How would you anticipate the donut will affect ultimate strengths of axial load or combined axial load and bending? So, so actually, we did have axial load. Um, it was a small axial load when we started the test. Uh, it was about 6% of the area gross times the compressive strength. But we found out that as we increased the load, Maybe I'll go back uh, to this and show you the, the setup. And as we increase the lateral load, 
the way we were loading the specimen, we actually uh, almost doubled. See, this is a follower load. So this bar that applies the load through the hydraulic jack, we double the axial load. So if we had an axial load of 100 kips, by the time we reached these very high drift ratios, that axial load became 200. So actually, we did have a very significant axial load, I would say at least 12% of the axial uh, column load capacity. And I think 12% is probably pretty close to where, depending, of course, if you had a, a band with three columns or two columns, uh, it could be a little bit higher than 12%. But I think 12% represents a fairly large axial load on these types of uh, small columns. I hope I, I, hope I answered that. Okay, thank you. Sure. So let me go back to the analysis. Um, yeah, so it was challenging to, to modify the properties of the steel to actually what was there when after these columns were damaged. Because when we applied the donut, as you remember, there was severe damage. And of course, we knew this, this uh, steel reinforcement had already gone way past. So in an earlier uh, model that was developed by another student, MJ Amelli, uh, he actually modeled uh, for the sleeves, for the supply sleeves, what would be the slip inside the sleeve itself. Uh, of course, uh, Ru Yang Wood actually took that a step further, and he also modeled the slip of the bars. In so now we have uh, two sources of slippage, and we can combine that. And if you can estimate the length of the plastic, up here, the donut, above the donut, we can actually find some strain, some fictitious strain, by which these bars now are elongating more. So, so for the same stress that this bar would see in the original steel, actually you would get now more strain. And, and that is the model that we use. You can see how the stiffness of the steel bars is actually the model. This is much reduced model. The model was reduced, if I remember correctly, to less than half the original elastic modules of the steel bars because of this effect. Uh, now, in our test, if you notice, uh, before we get to even 9% drift ratio, because of the way we're applying the drift, we're increasing the drift uh, every two cycles. Of course, we are severely penalizing these columns, which would never happen in an earthquake. In an earthquake, you wouldn't have 16 or 18 cycles of increasing drift. That's not a natural earthquake. And this phenomenon leads to something called the low cycle. This has been studied by Kunath and others. They developed a model by which you reduce the capacity of your steel uh, to, to resist stresses by the function of the strain. So the larger the strain the bars will see, the lower their capacity to resist tensile stress, and also the number of cycles. So it's a very well-known model, the coffin Matson model, where you reduce the capacity of the bars and you predict their fracture because of the lyocycle fatigue. It's a very similar phenomenon. If you take a paper clip and you bend it a number of times, after a few cycles, you see that the paper clip fracture in low cycle. So in the analysis model, one of the things we did, in, a, in addition to the earlier model I showed you with the fibers, we, there is another method where we concentrate uh, uh, the damage into a spring. We call this the concentrated plasticity model. It's a nonlinear rotation spring. The challenge, of course, here now we have four nodes instead of three. And the challenge is to determine the properties of this zero length rotation spring that would actually simulate test. So in this case, we use something called a hysteretic material to define the spring. And as you can see here uh, in the donut, we have everything. We have the damaged steel. We have the headed steel bars. We have the covered concrete. We have the, the non string concrete. And then we have the rigid wall. So again, the properties of this spring uh, is not trivial to determine. Uh, we used uh, a model like this. It's a moment rotation curve with three points, the yielding point, the ultimate strength point, and the residual strength point. Uh, these, these lines were determined uh, from existing models for reinforced concrete columns by diesel ton. And uh, 
it, it's challenging to determine these points, especially the transitional one, because it asks you actually to find out how much will be the rotation after you reach the columns. Uh, to do that, uh, you need to do sectional analysis, moment curvature, and consider the steel strain and the bone strength. And this is a model developed by Rekti uh, from 1999. And you can see that the rotation here can be expressed in terms of this information, which includes not only the, the yielding displacement of the bar, but also the bone slip that may happen. And this will give you the moment, uh, the rotation capacity. You already know the shear, you know the moment, so you can plot it. So here's a comparison of the two models. The one in blue is the earlier one that I showed you, the fiber. And this is the repair of the casting place uh, beam uh, column element. And this is the model with the concentrated spring, rotational spring. So you can see uh, this is the same specimen. You can see the black line is the test, and the blue line is the fiber model, and the red line spring model. Definitely both models are doing rather well. Uh, there is an advantage of the model fiber. I will explain it a little bit later. And uh, you can see that we can predict actually the performance of that. Oh, so here is the advantage. So uh, this is here the precast column. And you can see these, these uh, red stars. This is actually the prediction where the bar fractured the repair space. Uh, the model fiber is able to actually predict this, how many cycles and, and at which cycle the bar will fracture above the donor. And the prediction is, in, is within one cycle of the experiment. And that's something actually the rotational spring model. On the other hand, the rotational spring model seems to be a little more robust when it comes to the energy and you can see here, uh, so black is the test, blue is the fiber, and red is the rotational spring. And you can see we can predict the hysteretic energy, which is really the area under these hysteresis loops, uh, rather well, even for the casting place or for the precast place. So uh, now that we know our models work, the question is, can we go to an actual bridge uh, simulate the damage that would happen from an earthquake, and then try to, to see if we can repair it. First of all, repair, develop the technique of the donut, see if we can design the donut. And then once we design the donut, uh, actually run some earthquakes to see what happens. Is this repair working or, or not? And so we very ambitiously here set on a path, find an us-built uh, multi-column bridge pen, uh, develop practical design tools for the donut, and then do a nonlinear pressure analysis and even some nonlinear time. So there's a bridge I know very well. That's the one I tested on South Temple in 1998. Uh, the columns are 24 feet high, three feet square. Cap beam is three by four feet cross section. And I'm giving you a little exercise in SI units here today. Uh, we did many things here, including securing uh, the pile caps to the piles, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with the headed bars and epoxying the bars. We also increased the cross-section of the gray beam. But the reason we selected this uh, bridge, we had good geotechnical data on the soil structure interaction with my colleague, Dr. Everett Button. Because when we did this test, we were doing the structural test, which was applying lateral load here at the cap beam. But we're also measuring the movement of the power caps. So, uh, Rovian, we developed this model again, where we have the three-column bed. And you can see the cap beam, you can see the lateral load here. And in addition, we modeled the gray beam. And we modeled some uh, soil structure interaction by using frictional springs of the soil, as well as the so all these frictional springs were actually calibrated based on our test from 1990. So here you see an example. We use simplified springs for the pile cap and the gray beam. This was from our student who did the work uh, back then. And you, here you can see the force versus pile cap springs. 
So this is the force at the calcap level, and you can see that the grade beam, frictional strength, and you can see the pile. We also, of course, have to model the concrete, uh, copper, concrete, and steel. And because here we're dealing with not only low cycle fatigue, we're also possibly dealing with repair buckling. We use the model by Takao and Takawa to model repair buckling. So here is a very non simplified uh, Stratton tie model of the donor. Uh, this was developed by Dylan Brown. And uh, you can see here. It's an early concept. Basically, you have the, the, the headed bars, including you have the carbon fiber donut, you're applying the lateral load. And so Dylan developed a full model, including the column strut and tie. And you can see in red here what the effect of the donut. The effect of the donut is actually tensile ring around it, and we mention at the very top, near the top of the head. We took this a step further because this involved modeling also. And we said, OK, we know the headed bars are here. They're going to develop their full tension. We know what the tension in the rebar in the column is from our sugar analysis. We know the tension. So from this simplified truss, which only includes the area of the donor, can we determine uh, what the tension is in the donor? And we modeled the whole donor with this single tie a single tensile member about a third down from the top all the way to the full height. It's roughly the top six inches. The donut was 18 inches. So we said, let's go one third. So we put that tension there. And sure enough, you can use some really mechanics to solve for the tension, because you already know this tension here. The headed bars, assuming they yield, and we know they yield. So now, we can determine this tension force. Now, if we take this tension force and think of it as a ring, this is the ring of the carbon fiber, cut a free body diagram. Now you can see we know the height. We know what the tension is here. That means each one of these sides will hold half the tension. So it's rather easy to determine the thickness of this jacket. Sure enough, we're not determining the vertical number of layers. But at least we're getting a very good handle on the hoop. So the thickness here is just half of the tension in the ring divided by the modulus times the height and times some efficiency coefficient, as I mentioned, 54%, and the ultimate strain of the carbon fiber volume. So there's no need to analyze the whole structure with this method. <coughs> we only need the lateral force and the tension force from the head of steel. So I think this is a convenient method find the number of layers of the donor. So once we know that, we can come back and after an earthquake, design the retrofit of this bridge, which, as I mentioned earlier, I, I knew it very well. So it was rather easy for me to go in and do the retrofit that we did before uh, in our test down there in the, in the live uh, full-scale testing and apply a donor uh, at the base, assuming that this uh, bridge was damaged. After. So um, knowing, of course, what we knew from our last test, we, we used the steel collar with studs, and we designed it as you know, for the actual in-place dimensions. So in this case, the donor was 42 inches tall. Uh, it had a very large uh, area, as you can see here. And uh, we applied the lateral force displacement that we knew of the bridge that we already tested in our experiment in 1998. Uh, then we applied the model and we figured out actually the model worked rather well. And we tried to see what if we ignore completely the soil. And then if you do neglect the soil interaction, you get a much stiffer response, which of course is not going to be very good try to do nonlinear time history. As far as the lateral force versus the pile cap displacement, the experiment shows you the squares. And we were able, actually, with our model, with the original bridge that we tested, to come very close to that response, at least 
up to the peak. Uh, so here is the uh, prediction then of what would happen if we were to retrofit the damage bridge like that. Uh, the original as built take 442 kip, the retrofit would be higher, uh, both in ultimate and guild force. Guild displacement roughly the same. It's different, of course, a little bit more ductility of the So here you can see the force displacement of blue is the, the original one as built, and red is the red here. Uh, so this actually allows you to, to design the thing. But what would happen in the real Earth? So we took 22 far field ground motions from here, selected group, and we did a probabilistic analysis. You can see here in pink, this is the design base Earth, part 1G in our case. And uh, we ran some analysis. You can see some typical base shear versus drift ratio hysteresis of the retrofit in the red and black as built, and uh, some strain in the concrete, see in the steel. You can get detail like that, pretty good detail actually. And uh, of course we had to compare to some uh, damage states. You can see Munder's suggestion and see that up to half a percent of drift, it's a minor spalling. Damage stage two, bar buckling up to two percent drift, moderate damage, five percent bar fracture, major damage, six percent collapse, and uh, some some other measures by Kowalski are strain limits on concrete, see here up to one point eight percent, life safety, steel tension six percent. You can never get that in the lab, of course, and the drift limit smaller in this case. So what happened? I can show you only one graph. I won't bother you with all these details. Uh, you can see the as built, uh, the black line uh, in the design base earthquake. The blue is the maximum critical earthquake. And you can see that the as built actually have serious life safety issues um, as you can see here on about one and a half percent. Uh, and even uh, for the maximum critical earthquake, there's a good chance that we would get into near collapse, right? And then if we do the retrofit repair, you can see that's the pink line. Uh, pink line makes you stay under the roughly the operational limit, and even it's under the design base earthquake. And the red line, even under uh, the maximum critical earthquake. You, you probably would reach a uh, good chance you would reach the life safety that it would collapse. So this shows you that you get a benefit by doing retrofit. So uh, I'm now close to the conclusions. Um, I want to uh, thank you for staying with me. Uh, and uh, we did develop a seismic rehabilitation method uh, with carbon fiber deposits both for hoop and vertical directions with heavy steel bars and non shrink concrete. And we were able to actually um, make sure that we get plastic hinge relocation. We also, in this method, develop a steel collar with shear studs, improves the bond between the non shrink concrete and the original. And we were able to restore strength and displacement capacity successfully. The columns were severely damaged, concrete crashing. Going to do not steel part fracture and backlink. Uh, developed a couple of analytical models with fibers and rotation spring, uh, which include bone slip effects, loading history effects, cyclic degradation of steel parts. Um, because we developed both of them, we think we can't decide which one is better. So we, we suggest you, somebody can use both to determine sort of like a lower and upper bound estimate of the load and the displacement. So the analytical model uh, included soil structure interaction and it predicted the experiments from the in-city test. We use simplified springs for the soil structure interaction. And we think that the proposed method with the carbon fiber donut jacket above the donut, uh, we employed that to retrofit an as-built bridge bend 
this we didn't do a test for this uh, retrofit. Uh, we were able to increase the lateral load capacity. This means we were able to develop some simplified design guidelines for this repair method. So using a simplified stratum time model, so some designer one day could use it uh, after a severe error. So I want here to acknowledge the Mountain Plains Consortium with the two research projects. I want to acknowledge for their structural precast that helped them build the specimens for the lab, SICA Corporation for providing the carbon fiber, and Headed Reinforcement Corporation for providing the heat for us. Um, many thanks to Mark Bryan, our Head Constructions Lab Manager of the Structural Lab, without whose help we couldn't be able to achieve half of what we did here. And to my colleague, uh, Professor Emeritus Larry Rivley, University of Utah, some of the, who was actually co PI on the original test bridge, but also had some good input in development of the product. Uh, finally, my former students, MJ Ambelli, uh, Sean Kohar, Abdul Pagi, I, I, Barton, and Trump, for helping with the experiments. And uh, this was a, a big job, as you can see, in addition to my co uh, here I provide all the references from that I used in this presentation. Some of it our own, and some of it from other investigators and researchers. And uh, with that, I want to thank you for participating, and I want to thank Chris and the Transportation Learning Network for giving me this opportunity to present you our Fantastic. Thank you, Chris, for a wonderful presentation and sharing those research findings. Obviously, very practical, very applicable, and uh, glad again for you taking the time to share that with our with our group. So, thank you for that. It's my pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's TLN event. Again, visit our website at translearning.org for upcoming learning opportunities and to access our learning management system. And there, you will find an archive or a warehouse of training resources for you, uh, as well as previously held sessions. Thank you again for your time, your attention, and participation today. Go out there, wash your hands, and don't forget to be awesome.